Welcome to Ragnarok and my latest 100 days video using only the assistance of dialers. If you do enjoy the video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe with notification bells turned on. Oh, and I also stream these challenges live on Twitch, so come on over and join the party. Link in the description below. On day one, we spawned on the beaches of Blue Obelisk, where I swiftly helped myself to the boxes that spawn around here, which dropped some nice loot, such as crossbows, metal hatchets, and pikes. I then placed down a thatch foundation with a mortar and pestle, and started to make up some narcotics, which I would then turn into trank arrows. Armed with my tranks, I set off in pursuit of my first dialo, and I soon found this level 95, so I dutifully tamed it. Now, you might notice these dialos look a little bit bigger than normal, and are even rideable. This is because, in the name of entertainment, I decided to use the Kraken's Better Dinos mod for this, which meant that there was a small chance that bigger dinos could spawn, which were both rideable and had slightly stronger stats. With the dialo tamed, I put down a temporary foundation, as I needed to make a smithy to make myself a metal pick. I was then attacked by my old nemesis, the Microraptor, who really does love an appearance in these 100 days videos, and seems to enjoy making a mockery of me at every moment possible. I then knocked out a level 85 regular dialo to see what the difference would be. Firstly, the HP stat was a fair bit lower, and while you could still put a saddle on it, you couldn't actually ride it, which is probably fair enough, as I would most likely have crushed the poor thing's back. I also wanted to start mating the dialos, as I had no idea what would happen if I mated a big dialo with a smaller dialo. I was relieved to see that it could be mated, although I'm not sure the smaller female felt the same way. The first two babies hatched and appeared to just be like a regular dialo, so I left that for now and went exploring for some more. While exploring, I did find this regular dialo with a whopping 31 points into melee. If the stats could successfully be transferred to the apex line, this could be a huge find. Only for me to decide to shoot it with stone arrows instead of trank arrows and kill it. Big brain play right there. I was really struggling to find the bigger species of dialo as I explored the northeast portion of the map. Any bigger ones I did find were extremely low level, and I had been told that there was only a 20% chance of the larger variant spawning instead of its smaller counterpart, so it did appear that the odds were against me. Upon making it back to my portable egg incubator, which comprised of some standing torches, I had a nice surprise waiting for me. It grew up big! It grew up big! What, the, what happened here? This was obviously some great news for me, as it appeared that you still could get the bigger dialo when mating, even if a smaller variant was involved. This drastically changed the game plan going forward, from here on out, as any dialo with a good base stat would be worth taming, no matter the size. Pity about that 31 melee, hey? I then took on a pack of raptors, and somehow managed to survive with half my health, showing me that these dialos were not to be messed with. It's actually worth noting here that dialos really were this size 65 million years ago, and Ark has vastly undersized the poor things. Hopefully they get a size increase in Ark 2. Oh! Hello there. Hello there. Hello there. The first max level dialo that I'd spotted had some pretty average stats, but I thought it was worth taming to see what that 25 points into melee would become after tame. Uh, I mean... It's alright, it's alright. As always, I do try and start my breed lines with 40 plus points into both health and melee, so this is what we would be aiming for, as usual. No, enable, enable mating. Felt like I'm mating like a chihuahua and a husky. It was at this point that my dialogue turned to me and went, Rampy, it's time to tell them about Surfshark. Protecting your identity in this new, rather scary at times digital era has become so, so important. And that is why I use Surfshark. Surfshark makes controlling your personal data so much easier, whether that is notifying you if your personal data leaks or allowing you to browse the web privately with the knowledge that no one can track or steal your data. On top of that, Surfshark also gives you the ability to access other countries' Netflix libraries, which of course is very different to what your own country has to offer and can be very useful. I've actually used Surfshark for over two years now to help protect my data and to access different streaming services. And if you use my link in the description or scan the QR code on screen, you will get a whopping 83% off a 24 month plan with an additional three months on top of that. Surfshark also do offer a 30 day money back guarantee. So there really is no downside to trying it out. Thank you so much to the folks at Surfshark for sponsoring this video. I was still on the lookout for a base location, but I was still itching to find my breeding stats so that I could get started on my breeding line. For now, I decided to place down some more temporary foundations in Viking Bay, where I would get some metal burning from the rocks nearby, while hatching some dialo eggs, for some science purposes, shall we say. I then headed back out into the wild, where I found this 145 dialo. Initially, it looked promising, but I was not happy to see it come out with even less melee than the previous one had tamed. 
So naturally, like the brutal man I am, I sacrificed dear Volpe and the Dilo in the hope that it would bring me some luck down the line. Now, at this point, my Twitch chat had reminded me that the best place on Ragnarok to find Dilos was the swamp. So at the huge speed of three miles an hour, off I popped to the swamp to see what I could find. The first Dilo I stumbled upon of a tameable level was this 130 over here, which turned out to be an absolute dud and was uh, completely useless. So of course, I decided to sacrifice this one as well. The swamp was full of some nasty stuff, including this Sarko, who very rudely decided to take me off my Dilo while I was in the middle of murdering him. The search continued as I used my awesome spyglass to check out Dilo after Dilo, and it hit rock bottom, where I must have encountered the worst 145 Dilo I have ever seen. Things appeared to be on the up when I found this 150 male with 28 points into melee. So, as a self-appointed bowler god myself, I bowled the Dilo and got ready for the easiest tame of my life. Oh! Hello, Snake. Have you come to give me some prime meat by any chance? Dilos are not the best at harvesting prime meat, bottle. Pain. After a very long run back to the swamp area where I retrieved my stuff, my Dilo killed the snake, and with the prime meat, I finally tamed up the 150. You're kidding me. It's got seven points. Seven points. It's got 37 points in movement speed. Now, seven points into melee after tame for a 150 tame was an absolute tragedy. And at this point, I was beginning to wonder whether my Dilo sacrifices had the absolute opposite effect. This was until I found something even better. This regular 150 Dilo had a massive 33 points into melee. The most amazing thing, however, was that down the hill was a 145 with 29 points into health. With a bit of luck here, my entire breeding line was about to be nicely set up within five minutes. Let's, let's have a go. Oh, it's 47 melee, it's not 47 melee. Ooh. 47 melee was an absolutely insane starter stat, and the second highest base stat we have seen since my 48 health starting raptor, that is. The health dialo wasn't quite as spectacular, as that did come out with 37 points into health. All things considered though, I was extremely happy, and was safe in the knowledge that these stats could carry over to the larger dialos from the smaller variants. I briefly had the scare of a lifetime when I thought my dialo breeders were going to die to this Ferrazino, only for the dialos to absolutely destroy it. I then set off on a cross-map adventure, which involved going through the very cold snow biome. I died plenty of times here, but using the good old sleeping bag trick to respawn on the same spot, I did eventually make it through. On the other side of the biome, I was greeted by some direwolves, and as you can hear, I was particularly worried about this. Oh, doll, 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 no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. So much trouble. Oh, no. Oh. No way. No way are we about to take all of them out. No way. The Dilos! Evidently, though, I had nothing to worry about, as my pack of Dilos took care of the Direwolves with not too much of an inconvenience. The reason I had gone through the snow biome was because I was going to check out the desert biome. I had been attracted to the idea of building in a desert, mainly because this biome has a lot of rather nice buildings, which are already built for you, and you don't need to do much to them. This would mean we wouldn't spend the full 100 days living off some foundations in the middle of nowhere, like the classic Rampy 100 days. Still, as this trip dragged on, I was beginning to realise quite how big of a trek this was. I was also starting to have some doubts over the suitability of the spot, as a large majority of the artefacts I needed to collect were found on the direct opposite side of the map, near Blue Obelisk. After arriving at one of the desert buildings, I came to the realisation that we had a bit of an issue. Same. They're all bloody male. So, after not bringing a single female Dalo with me to the desert, I had to trek all the way back through the desert, through the redwoods, through the Microraptors, which were once more back again, to finally reach the highlands. There, I found this level 95 female Dilo, which I knocked out and prepared to tame. Please be female. Yeah, standard stuff. Just a normal day in the art world. Just, just a normal day. 
I tamed up a second female a little bit further down the beach, and then returned to the first dialo, as I prepared to trek once more all the way back to the desert. But back at base, it was time for some breeding, and thus, it was time for some eggs. 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 I then put down some standard thatch foundations, and bred some dialos, hoping for some bigger variants. Although some of them were actually missions wouldn't be too bad. Why aren't you big? Why are you not big? Oh, hello, Dial. Oh, have you, oh, you've, you are definitely a big boy. You are definitely a big boy. I left base to go and get some materials, and on the way found a desert drop, which had a metal shield in it and some riot boots. Sadly, not anything that would be of too much use. The materials I was after was some crystal, some organic polymer, and some oil, so that I could make some cryopods. I had decided at this point that the desert biome wasn't for me, but I didn't fancy trekking halfway across the map with my entire Dialo army on follow behind me, so I decided an investment of some cryos was my best bet. After making the cryos, my long journey began, and when I arrived at my new base location, I set about making a masterpiece. What the fuck is this piece of shit? After placing down some thatch foundations for what I hoped to be the last time, I hatched some baby dilos with the help of my standing torches, which gave them the needed heat. I was looking for 0, zero females in order for me to start the mutation grinding. I am aware that I say this pretty much every video, but if you don't know how I do my breeding and are interested, I would recommend watching my 100 days with just raptors videos, as I go in depth a bit more in it there. On the recently turned day 30, I set out inland to get some beaver dams. Luckily, rag is quite good for the old cementing paste, which is exactly what I was after. On my way back to base, I looted a blue drop, which had an apprentice sword in it, which I thought might come in handy at some point. At base, I made myself a fabricator, as I wanted to make myself an egg incubator, which is a key ingredient for any type of mutation breeding, as it allows you to see the stats before the egg is hatched. I did then briefly stumble across the lava golem cave, which did contain an artifact I needed, but I wasn't quite prepared for that yet. Instead, I set about getting the necessary resources I'd need for the egg incubator, which is quite a pricey item. Hesperornis were a nice source of some more local organic polymer, and I found some crystal in the mountains not far from my base. I then had to return to the beavers once more, who were still very upset that I had raided their dams from last time. Tech dinos such as this tech parasol here provided a great source of electronics, so I made sure to kill them whenever I saw one. On my way back to base, I saw this 150 female dialo. You might be wondering why I decided to tame it, given its very underwhelming stats, and that is because I had noticed a very worrying trend that a lot of our 0, zero dialos we were breeding back at base were coming out with only 2 points into weight, and we could not be dealing with this, especially as I was planning on riding a dialo in the final boss. This female came out with 42 weight, so I was aiming to integrate this stat into our line somehow. At base, I finally had the resources to make myself an egg incubator. After making myself an electrical generator in order to power it, I placed it down. It was now time for the mutation progress to really begin. Throughout the days of 30 to 40, the mutation grind got underway, and we had already begun some good progress on the line. Alongside this, I had decided to get on the hunt for some artifacts. When I first announced that I'd be doing 100 days of Ragnarok with Dilos, a lot of you were curious as to how I would manage some of them. Well, the first one wasn't too bad, as it was located in some sort of shrine in the jungle, not too far from base. You do have to break a rock to find it, and it's just little small things like this that I really appreciate about Ragnarok. You just had to be playing Ark in 2017 when it released to know how truly legendary this map is. Returning to base, I made up some grappling hooks and then set off for the next cave, which I have always called the Dark Cave. Yes, believe it or not, that is because the cave is rather on the dark side. Inside the cave, I used a torch to light the way, and then grappled up to get the Artifact of the Cunning, which can be found in this cave. I then managed to get completely and utterly lost for about 20 in real life minutes, and despite having a few encounters with my aberration arch nemesis, the Megalosaurus, I did eventually make it out of the cave in one piece. I then set my sights on the Artifact of the Immune, which is located nearby in the Swamp Cave, which can be found near the Ragnarok Castle. It's safe to say that I was getting the easier artifacts out of the way first, as Ragnarok is notorious for having some difficult artifacts, which is probably why I never got the artifacts on this map before. Yes, I was going into all of these artifacts completely blind, with only dialers. After escaping the cave and setting off back to base, I ran into a red drop on the way, and looted myself a pair of flat leggings. At base, I returned to the mutation grind. It didn't matter if these dialers hatched as a smaller or larger variant, as when it came to breeding the boss dialers, these stats would be transferred, and of course only the larger ones would be kept. One reason I was so eager to get this mutation breeding, is that I wanted to get a certain someone involved in this challenge as soon as possible. Long time fans of the channel may know who I mean. I eventually decided to stop the mutation breeding for now, with the current stats of 59 melee and 47 health. I then made myself up a set of flak, and prepared to take on my biggest challenge of this 100 days so far. 
the Life's Labyrinth. Now, I was told that I would need a sacrifice for this, and of course, as we know over here, we are always happy to oblige when it comes to sacrifices. And so the journey commenced. And yes, once more, I was going all the way across the map, back to the desert. I thought I was done with this cross-map journey, but I guess not. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I have never done any of these artifacts before, so as I entered the labyrinth, the Twitch chat were eagerly awaiting my demise. The first section of the labyrinth sees you dodging some spikes which come out of the ground. When you go through the entrance, you then have to spell out the word Gratter, pushing the buttons in the right order. The problem was that this involved some parkour to actually get up to the majority of these buttons, so as I had an absolutely terrible time trying to navigate my way around, the chat were enjoying themselves thoroughly. Eventually, I started to get into the swing of things and managed to reach the second segment of the cave. Uh, do I go? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh! Ow! What? Oh, we're dead. We're dead. We're actually dead. So, obviously, the brief video I had watched on the labyrinth wasn't enough. And to make matters worse, I hadn't placed any sleeping bags down. Rookie error 101 right there. After spending over a full day traipsing across the map once more, I eventually arrived back, and this time I did remember to place some sleeping bags down. I completed the Gratter section once more, and just as things were starting to look up, I burnt myself to death again. I completed Gratter again, and then died again. This trend continued for a while, as it was just mess up after mess up, but by the time I actually did make it through the first door, the Twitch chat had basically given up on me. After recovering my stuff and making it through the first section, I carried on, this time with the assistance of my trusty Darlo, who would help me along the way. There was one very nerve-wracking section where you had to jump over these metal spikes, which kept popping out of the ground, but to pretty much everyone's surprise, including mine, I uh, absolutely smashed this section. Oh. Okay. Bait out the trap! After avoiding the grenades that this labyrinth kept throwing at me, I looted a red drop, and carried on pushing the buttons in the right order, which opened up the correct doors. After opening up this door here, you have a very brief amount of time to run around the corner and into an enclosed space before you become a victim of toxic gas, and no one wants that. After just about surviving the toxic gas by the skin of my teeth, I advanced further into the cave, taking out the host of creatures that had spawned. At this point, my main concern was if one of the bats gave me mega rabies, as I believe this is possible, but so far so good, as all these onyx seem to be clean. Next up, I had another parkour section, although this time I was able to use the dialo, as it meant that it would take far reduced damage on my character from the spikes that popped out of the ground. There were also a few good cave loot crates in this cave, and the best most useful one I got was this red drop, which gave me an ascendant fur cap and an ascendant sword. The fur cap would be very very useful, as one of the final caves we had to do was rather on the cold side shall we say. After completing the final parkour section, I arrived at the artifact of the Sky Lord. I then had to literally sacrifice a dialo, which went up in flames, to open the next door. This led me to what I believed to be a boss fight of some sorts, and after pressing the last button, the final door slid open. This boss battle wasn't actually too difficult. Starting at level 50, a wave of ghost dire bears and ghost direwolves would spawn. Every wave, these would go up 50 levels, and that capped out at level 250. Might sound intimidating, but a couple of my dialos dealt with these no problem. After taking care of the final wave, the wall protecting the final two artifacts was no more, and I collected both the Artifact of the Clever and the Artifact of the Devious. I was now left with one problem. Even after making my way out of Life's Labyrinth into safety, I had to go back in again. This is because there is actually two sections in here, and you choose which way you go in the room where I was burnt to death over and over. So, once more, I found myself having to do some parkour to activate the Gratter buttons, and I then made my way down into the fire room and very carefully managed to keep out of range of the breathing fire to make it over to the right hand side door. If you remember previously, I would opted to take the left route first, so this time I was in completely uncharted territory. Behind this door, I was greeted by a surprise, another parkour segment. I spent about 10 minutes of my life trying to do this segment, as if you've ever done any parkour on Ark before, you will know, it isn't the most fun game mechanic that Ark has to offer. This was honestly, however, probably the hardest section of the right hand side, and while the following rooms had various hostiles to deal with, and the occasional booby trap that you had to watch out for, I found myself at the Artifact of the Clever, in what felt like a far quicker time than the other section of the cave. I then once more had to sacrifice a poor Dilo to the flames, and obviously I had no interest in fighting the final boss this time, as I had already got those artifacts, so I quickly dipped out of the cave, and made my way back to base. At base, I had to start breeding up the boss Dilos, so that they had enough time between now and day 100 to heal up. Our mutation breeding had now finished, and with the final stats of 61 melee and 49 HP, I decided it was time to combine them. It was also time to bring back a channel legend, 
So as I hatched up the Dilo with the best stats, as well as a decent weight stat of course, just like that, Lightning McQueen the Dilo was born. Who would of course, be my speed Dilo. Throughout days 60 to 70, it was all about preparing for the boss. I first bred up some boss breeder females. These would be females with good melee and HP stats. I chose to do this as because I only had about a 20% chance of getting the large, rideable Dilo variant, I needed to make sure that I would be getting the best stats every time. This was actually a pretty successful strategy, and any of the Dilos that weren't the larger variant, I would simply murder using a fully raised boss Dilo to gain them some XP. This challenge would see the return of not one legend, but two, as I even made myself an oxygen Dilo. I had three artifacts to get, and one of them would involve a trip down into the deep depths of the ocean, as I figured having an oxygen Dilo would be somewhat useful. As we hit day 65, I continued to hatch up the boss Dilos. We were up to 13 of them now, and of course I would be targeting 20, as that is how many creatures can be brought into the Ragnarok boss arena. But suddenly, I received word that it was time to take a test drive. Okay, here we go. Focus. Speed. I am speed. One winner. 42 losers. I eat losers for breakfast. Speed. I'm faster than fast, quicker than quick. I am lightning. Hey, lightning, you ready? Oh, yeah. Lightning's ready. I'm American made, but a lot of Indeed, Lightning McQueen was ready to go, and after applying his new paint job, we set off an adventure. The artifact of the Devourer in our sights. Having McQueen at my service made getting across the map a hell of a lot easier, and it is certainly a shame that we didn't have him for the many treks I had to do to the desert and back. I built up a raft near the swamp and headed out to sea with McQueen at my side. Now the reason I was here is because this is where the artifact of the Devourer is found, and this is where Oxygen Dilo was meant to come into play. Now the main problem with the artifact of the Devourer is that it's located in the middle of what is commonly known as the Ragnarok Tuso Mosh Pit. If you ever want to tame a Tuso, come to Ragnarok and take a look here, as it is absolutely teeming with them. I tried to sneak down undetected, and I almost got away with it, until I was spotted by this level 20 Tuso. I was actually winning the fight against the level 20, and I may well have survived the whole encounter, only for a 135 Tuso to turn up at the scene, and ruin my day. I was not going to stand for this however, but it was clear that I would require a significant DPS upgrade if I was to have any success. So a couple of days later, I returned with the Absolute Squadron, and we plunged down into the depths together. The plan was simple, get the Dialos to distract and hopefully kill the Tusos, while I swam to the bottom to get the artifact. The first part of this plan went beautifully, and I collected the artifact before swimming back up to the surface to help my Dialo friends. When low on health, Tusos do this ink attack and then sprint away, so at this moment I hastily attempted to retreat to the surface, as I realised how low on oxygen I was getting. Sadly, as I was just about to reach the surface on my own Dialo, all but one of our heroes perished in the water. These sacrifices would not be forgotten. McQueen and I set off back to base on our raft, before deciding to take a trip to Desert Biome to check for desert loot crates. I was desperate to find myself a pump action shotgun for the final boss, but I only managed to find the Ascendant Compound Bow, which, while it wasn't bad, wasn't quite what we were looking for. I then stopped by the Wyvern Scar on the way back to level some of our remaining Dilos. A lot of the Dilos had leveled enough from a mix of passive XP and from murdering their offspring, but I decided to level the last 5 or 6 in the Wyvern Scar, as Wyverns give some of the best XP of any Dino on the game. Back at base, the Dilos were all good to go, as they were leveled and saddled. I just had to wait for them to heal, but as we were currently on day 74, they should have had plenty of time for that. I had two remaining artifacts to go before I could summon the final boss, so McQueen and I set off into the jungle to look for the artifact of the hunter, which can be found in the Lava Golem cave. I opted to leave McQueen outside of the cave as I just couldn't risk losing him. Instead, I brought in an older generation Dilo, in case I needed any backup in there. I did decide early on to cryo in though, as it seemed that grappling through this cave would be my best bet of getting around swiftly. It's a bit scary now. Oh, I lagged. Wasn't that green drop at the top? Oh, sending Gilly. Sending Gilly's not too bad. Gilly's always useful to have. After entering the main room of the cave, I looted a red drop, which had an ascendant Gilly chest BP in, which might be some use for me later on. I then found a yellow drop in the same room, which had an Ascendant cloth shirt and Ascendant long neck rifle in it. Not quite the shotgun that I was craving so much. 
With the drops looted, I grapple my way up past the lava waterfall and towards the entrance of the artifact chamber. Oh, there's a spider in the wall. Oh, where have you come from? Yeah, get clapped. Is this the wrong way? Oh, there's another one. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Well, I just want the art. Ah, oh, it's a bit of an issue. In the chamber, I threw out my Dilo to kill the remaining hostiles and then grappled over where I picked up our penultimate artifact, the artifact of the hunter. I grappled back over the lava to safety and then exited the cave, fully intact. However, after briefly stopping in at base, the chat and I actually decided to return to try out something a bit on the crazy side. You see, the Lava Golem boss fight which you can do in here is one of the best ways to get loot in the game, dropping some great blueprints and I believe also some pre-crafted items. The main thing I wanted of course, as I've mentioned before, was a good pump action shotgun, and with time running out I saw this as one of my last opportunities. To reach the Lava Golem, you first have to break through this heap of crystal which is blocking the entrance, before entering through a crouch zone. Now, my method of madness that I had in mind here was by accessing this high up ledge over here. Traditionally, when people do Lava Golem, they use this ledge and will fire things such as rockets at it. Now, I didn't have access to this, but what I did have access to was a Dilo Spit Attack by using the right click. It might have done a measly 30 damage of course, which we didn't quite realise until we went in, but we were slowly ticking off its health, and with the slow-mo command, we were making some good progress. The problem with the strategy though, is that occasionally a rogue boulder, which the golem throw, may come out of nowhere and somehow make it up on the ledge and ruin your day, which is exactly what happened here. The main thing we need to do is slow mo five it. It's the only way that... Hmm. And just like that, the dream was over, but there was no time to hang around, as I needed to set off for the last artifact, located in the ice cave. I named a couple of dialos with some fitting names, as I was convinced that we may have some casualties in this cave. With the battle dialos cryoed up, I left with Lightning McQueen to track down the entrance to the cave. I'm pretty sure that there are multiple entrances to this cave, and I ended up going in through what I think is the flyer entrance. Inside, I cryoed McQueen up, and led the pack of war dialos deeper into the cave. Right, I'm guessing it's down that big cavern there, right? Just looks like a type of place which has a has a cheeky ice worm. <laughs> we had five at the end. Yeah, but it's alright though, Massey, because... Ah. However, unlike in previous challenges, I had a new mantra, and there would be no Dilo left behind today. After saving the Dilo from a forever lonely life, we advanced further in. It was beginning to get far colder now, so I knew that we must be getting close. I initially opted to take the left hand side path, as I was told it was the best way to go if you wanted to pick up the red drops this cave has to offer. I wasn't too impressed however, with what the first one had to offer. Let's see what we've got. To... Are you taking the mick? Are you really taking the mick? I've come all that way for some cloth pants. After returning back to the middle section to cry on my remaining dialos, I fought off the ice worms that came our way. We were almost at the end now, ready to take on the ice worm queen, when we found one more red drop. Oh, it's a red drop here. Yeah? I can see a red glow. What's in it? No way. No way. Oh. <laughs> ah. Let's go. How much is it to make? Expensive, but it doesn't matter. It does not matter. That's a game changer. Oh, wow. Now, I was told that when I went into this boss fight, I would have to cryo up all my dialos, as the Ice Worm Queen wouldn't spawn if I had a single creature out. So I swam through the cold depths of the water and plunged down a freezing waterfall until I arrived in the boss arena itself. The arena was freezing, even with my Ascendant Fur cap on, so it was clear that this would be a race against the clock. Ah! Uh... We gotta get out of it! We gotta go, Dalos. We gotta go. Oh, they can't hit me. I just realised they can't hit me. Is that the dragon? They can't hit the Dalos. 
We gotta go. Where's the... Where's the artifact again? Where's the artifact? It's in like one of these rooms, right? After killing the Ice Worm Queen, I made a break for safety and was incredibly relieved to see that the tunnel leading to the artifact was actually a lot warmer than the actual arena itself. I was now no longer even cold, let alone freezing, and the artifact of the pack is accessible once you have beaten the boss. It has to be one of the coolest artifacts on the whole of Ark, and this sleeping Giga here, which of course is meant to be fed to the Ice Worm Queen's babies, is such a nice but also really eerie touch on the Ragnarok devs. Yeah, if you can't tell by now, I really really like this map. Out of the cave now, I was about to set off for home, when I was given a heart attack. Guys? Where's Lightning McQueen? Lightning! No! Lightning! Lightning! Just as all looked lost, we were reminded why we can never write off legends. Alright. Well, I'll try. He's, in He's arrived! I'm sorry. This is a, it's, what a great day. Never give up on McQueen. After returning to base, we had to immediately turn our sights to making that shotgun. The blueprint was pretty expensive, but I set off to the volcano area with a raft, McQueen, and some storage boxes to store polymer in. After arriving there, I killed a host of mantises and then dropped the organic polymer into the boxes. Next up was cementing paste, but thankfully the beavers have been going absolutely mental and making a ton of dams, which I gleefully raided once more. Pretty sure I'm on the beaver hit list at this point. With everything ready, I waited a couple of days for the remaining metal to smelt, and then finally made the Ascendant Shotgun. I mainly was so invested in getting a shotgun, as the Manticore and Ragnarok can be a real pain at times, as it often refuses to land. I was conscious my dialos had a very low torpor stat, and I was expecting plenty, if not all of them, to be asleep by the actual end of the fight. The final step was to make some ammo for my shotgun, and I had been saving up my charcoal from day one, so I had an ample supply, all good to go. After spending a day or two making some gunpowder and shotgun ammo, I lastly made up some medical brews, and then we were good to go. The last thing I did, which I do during the finale of every challenge, is naming the dialos after my loyal Twitch followers. So if you want a creature named after you in the future, come on over and join the stream community. Link is in the description below. It was now time to put an end to this. After the disappointment of what happened on Genesis 1, I was determined to end this challenge on a high. But could we really beat Ark Ragnarok with only dialos? Let's find out. The finale of 100 days with just Dilophosaurs, starting now. Let's get it. Let's get it. Come on, Dilophosaurs. We're all in. Okay, Dragon's landing. Go, Dragon. Go, Dragon. Under the Dragon. Ow. 25%. Ah, oh, this is going to be an issue. Okay, come on. Yeah, once we get under, we should be fine. Oh my god. Look at the DPS. Uh, what? Hello? Hello, dragon? Uh, dragon? Are you good? Dragon's not good. Dragon is dead. Dragon's so dead. Ow. Manticore, get on the Manticore, get on the Manticore. Oh, that's Griffins. But yeah, we got some serious damage mutations on these dialers. We got some... I got 63 melee. Manticore is... Is the Manticore stuck in the dragon's body? We're all stuck in the in the body, I've just realised, aren't we? We're all stuck in the dragon... Oh, okay, no... He's landed, he's landed. 
Get the manticore, get the manticore. The fight was actually going far better than expected. I thought the dragon would go down quickly, as the dragon is actually notoriously weak on rag, but my main surprise was the lack of damage that the manticore was doing. I was mainly scared of it spamming its torpor attack and knocking my entire army out, but it seemed to be using that attack pretty rarely so far. Uh oh. I'm getting out of here. Are they, are they actually going to kill the golem? Are they actually going to kill the golem? Go on, Dilos! Go on, Dilos! I, is the Manticore slowed? I'm 1v1 in him. He's not even doing that attack. Dilos is still 1v1 in the golems. Right. They're going to lose this fight as well to the golems. There's no point even trying. Come on, golems. Come on, Dilos. This way. DPS has got to be on the manticore. There we go. That's better. There we go. Big DPS. Ooh, okay. Oh, it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Manticore's just taking, like, damage just from flying around in that area, though. Manticore's on 28k. Holy... This is great. Just sticking around the golems just, just seems to be the strategy, honestly. 24k on the Manticore? He's just getting annihilated whenever he goes through. Oh, he's done. Oh, you, you tease. You naughty, naughty. He's done. He's done. On him. Ow. 8k. On him. Come on, Dilos. He's almost done. He's almost there, Dilos. 4k. 3k. And he's down. The Dilos are victorious without a single death. Without a single death. Thank you all so much for watching my latest 100 days journey. If you did enjoy, please do remember to leave a like on the video as it really does help the channel. And of course, subscribe if you haven't already. I do have a Sons of the Forest 100 days dropping next week. And of course, plenty more awesome art content in the pipeline for the coming months. I hope you all have a great rest of your day, guys, and do take care of yourselves.